Linux SQL Super Cold and Logs. Thank you. Cheers, man. Uh, thanks everyone for jumping into this one. Um, to set the record straight on the title, the logs are actually pretty good. Uh, they do have a lot of detail in them. Um, but as we'll go through the presentation, the, the super quality and the problems come about in, in just the whole uh, deploying and getting the logging working uh, across MS SQL. Um, quick who am I slide, I got bullied into putting this into the presentation yesterday at work. Um, I'm Tristan, um, I work at Seamless Intelligence and you can make your files up these days. So log enthusiast, uh, we spend a lot of time in logs, getting logs into monitoring, uh, building detections out of logging um, and anything uh, else to do with logs. Uh, the bottom GitHub repo there uh, contains a heap of artifacts from the presentation today. Uh, so there's detections, uh, there's some metadata related to those. The SQL queries that we'll run through are all in there as well. Um, so if you're ever really bored and want to turn logging on in a SQL database, it should all be there. Um, so while we're talking about SQL logging in 2023, we went down a massive rabbit hole uh, that started here with uh, a hack the box box. Um, called escape and the initial access into this box was to use a stored procedure in uh, MS SQL Which is called Dirtry. Uh, it's a pretty dangerous one. It's been on Microsoft's hit lists um, for a while now uh, to change the default configuration in Dirtry to stop it being uh, Executable by any user which it is by default as we can see here um, Running an nmap on this box MS SQL is open we dug into that hole we're able to execute this stored procedure uh, called Dirtry, which basically reaches out uh, and will list the directory structure of a share. In this case, we point it back to, to our box running responder, and um, beautifully it tries to authenticate to us and we get the NTLM hash for the account running the SQL service. Uh, which will either be, in this case, it's uh, a user account there, SQL underscore service, uh, or it'll be the system account. The problem with all of this came when we, we like to grab the hack the box boxes and where we can turn them into something in our research environment to play with, we will do that. Uh, and so we began to execute Dirtry uh, with all of the default logging turned on MSS drill to see what we could detect based on that. Now, if an attacker jumps onto a Windows box, um, does whatever they're going to do on a Windows box, then it's relatively simple to detect a lot of tactics, uh, uh, tactics and techniques there um, off the OS itself. The big reason for this is the amount of information out there. We have, uh, that's the ACSC log uh, event forwarding guide. It has a heap of good configuration about what you need to do in group policy to get the logging set. I have then forward that using Windows event forwarding. And that's OS logs. And we can generate a heap in Windows uh, natively. We can look to install something like Sysmon, uh, which is free and owned by Microsoft now, to, to up uh, that logging as well. Uh, and there's really only one overlap between native Windows logs and Sysmon, and that's the process creation logs. Everything else in Sysmon is unique to Sysmon uh, and generally can't be generated on the OS natively. We get something like uh, device logs from Defender. So almost all organisations are going to have a level of EDR on a box, so we're not needing to add more products to monitor the operating system. Device logs coming off Defender are, are very similar, if not the same, as Sysmod logs. And then you'll have your other EDR products. Um, so you have a CrowdStrike on there, which we can get raw logs as well as alerts off that box. So on the OS itself, we have so many options and it's pretty well documented how to turn all of this logging on. If an attacker jumps into MS SQL and stays mostly within the database, our opportunities to detect them are far, far fewer. Um, as you can see there, and this is us jumping in and running some commands, we get a few. Um, the detail is not all that important, um, but you can see from the colour on the risk on these alarm cards on the right hand side there, they're pretty low level. So we're getting things coming out of MS SQL, but we may not fully understand what an attacker is doing within SQL. When we started to look at the configuration and how to address this, we ran into a big problem in that trying to find the same advice for MS SQL that we have out there for Windows security just led us to products. So all of those links there, we went to them, each one of them, they may have some technical detail, um, but ultimately if you try and look into it, 
uh, any further than um, superficially, they try to sell a product. Uh, all of them. Um, we thought attacking Microsoft SQL Server databases would be a good article to start, um, but I think that's NetRight. No, that's StealthBits. Um, but they sell a product to look for you as well. So there's not that community and, and that um, open source configuration, documentation, all the good things that we have for native Windows security logs. It doesn't exist. Where it exists, what we found is it's mostly related to auditing. Uh, and unfortunately, those audit configs, while they serve a purpose, they don't actually help us detect attackers very well. I even went and asked ChatGPT and Bing, or whatever it's called, how do I detect attackers in MS SQL? Tell me, then I don't have to do much work. Um, ChatGPT spews out, and it always does this, uh, a heap of text. It's, it's not very good, it's wrong. Um, Bing went off a path in extended events and auditing and that sort of stuff. Um, and this is what we found generally when we're trying to research this. Um, I've just highlighted those. Um, and I see this a lot in advice for monitoring. Just detect unusual patterns of access. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew what they were, it would be easy. Um, look for suspicious patterns. It's a suspicious pattern. Look for unexpected, unauthorised connections. So the advice is always quite high level, uh, and, and technically, I can't turn that into anything useful, really. If I could, I wouldn't have a job to be easy. So first issue, big issue that we ran into. Second big issue, we spun an, uh, spun an FCCM box up, um, thinking there might be a chance, Microsoft product, built-in SQL database, all that sort of good stuff, that there would be some default logging. Uh, there, there isn't. Um, so the three bits we need, we need a security audit, uh, which we'll, we'll go through in a sec. We need database audits to tell the database what to uh, logs to send us. And then we need a server audit. And none of those are present uh, in, in any of the people installs that we saw. You do get a cool tick box here for login auditing, which will uh, log failed and successful login attempts. Uh, that's about it. Not that useful by itself. Uh, authentication is generally not got a lot of context. We don't know what a user is doing or, or an account is doing. Can be useful with all the other logging, but by itself, this being the only option to, to easily get at, uh, it's not particularly useful. So what we had to do was build everything from scratch, basically. Uh, we couldn't detect anything that we did in the uh, MS SQL database with the built-in logs. So we built a set of configuration, uh, which is in the GitHub repository, and that's two SQL scripts which go through and turn on all the logging that we'll go through in a sec. Uh, a heap of documentation, uh, which helped us track where we were with uh, both testing tools, uh, testing the detections, and which piece of logging was responsible for that detection firing. Um, and as we go through the documentation, we, we, it took us hours and hours and hours to do this, and I'll show you why as we go through the demo. Um, no two things are the same in SQL, um, and in Windows, if we want to do something like steal a certificate or abuse certificate authority servers, get a certificate and authenticate that to the domain to get a Kerberos ticket, it's kind of one way to do it. You, you're going to generate something on the domain controller that we can detect. With MS SQL, what we found going through this, you can, do it, you can do it four, five, six different ways and achieve the same goal. Which, when we're trying to detect that, as we'll go through in the demo, it's really difficult because I can't just do one test, be happy that that's captured the, uh, the detection, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. We built out all the detections, um, we'll go through some of those, and then we built an attack, tried to build an attack demo um, to show the before and afters for this. <coughs> Favorite bit, configuration. Uh, the server audit needs to be turned on. So there's the three, three bits we need. This is the first one. Uh, and what this will do is just tell the SQL server where to log the logs. Uh, in this case, we've added them down into the application log. We've set a name, um, and then we've turned it on in this SQL. The big advantage of doing it in the script is, well, there's a number of advantages. We get consistency. We're not going to make typos. We're not going to miss things, which you'll see in the GUI would be really easy to do. And this turns the logging on. Uh, if we do it through the GUI, we actually need to go and restart the SQL services for those configuration changes to make uh, to, to come into effect. So this just turns logging on. So now, if a log is generated, it will go into the application logs locally. Then we can use Windows Event Forwarding or whatever other mechanism we uh, got set up to forward that where we need to. 
This is the GUI version of the same piece of SQL. Um, we would tick a few buttons, we'd say OK, and then we'd have to restart the services. And this is how we started doing all of this config, including this stuff. This is where some of the title for the slide was. This is painful. Um, this is the SQL statements to turn on the login for each of these items that we want. So we can see the top one there is the XP CMD shell stored procedure and that would allow us to execute commands as the account running the SQL Server on the operating system. So we want to audit that one. What I would have loved to have been able to do is use like star characters uh, and contains and say, hey, if anyone executes a stored procedure of any name, let me know. I can't do that. We need to do them line by line. So I need to say, if there's an execution of this stored procedure, let me know. If there's an execution of this stored procedure, let me know, and so forth. And there's 160 lines of uh, queries or, or um, uh, configuration that we want to turn on. If we go back to our testing, we then test a tool and we say, okay, I'm going to run XP command shell to do a who am I on a system. Okay, yep, that all worked. But there can be other ways to get code to execute as, as we'll show later. We have to then test that. Oh, our detections didn't fire and I've got no logs. What is the stored procedure I need to audit now? So all of this, at the end of the day, we really believe this is the bare minimum. Um, we're not going to catch absolutely everything, but there's a good chance to catch a number of techniques um, and tool sets being used with this configuration that we have. We also then got into a position where we were able to execute as the uh, as public, basically, uh, in, in that role. And as you can see here, these are auditing for the DBO um, role or privilege or whatever it is in SQL. So we had to double these and then do them for different privileges. So this set of configuration is there three times, with the only change being the end uh, privilege group or whoever can access or execute those stored procedures. That's the full text. It was just, it, it's, it is what it is. It's what we do to get the detail that we need, uh, but it is very frustrating when you spend all this time, run a whole new tool and get no detections. And we were in that position where we had to go back to the drawing board to add more and more monitoring. Here it is in the GUI. Don't do it in the GUI. Um, <laughs> it's where we started. We started and spent too much time here. There's a couple of reasons why not. Um, firstly, you, you will get RSI, you've got to drop down select, object, sys. Then you've got to search for the stored procedure or whatever you want to monitor. And not all the stored procedures are there. Whereas when we add them in the SQL, because we've found a reference to them in a tool and we want to audit them, it accepts it and we can audit those stored procedures. But if we just went by what was available in the search GUI, we wouldn't get all the stored procedures. No idea why that is. But yeah, don't do it. Um, then we have the server order specs. These we can think of, think of the other ones as inside each of the databases we want to know about what's going on. And we have, uh, we may have a SQL server with 10 databases, we need to apply that config to each of those databases within that database server. This one we can apply just to the server as a whole and it's mostly used for group changes, configuration changes, impersonations, things that happen at a more server wide level. The big problem with this for us is I don't actually know if I need all of those. Um, a stored procedure is easy. If I execute XP command shell and I get something that outputs a command to the system, I can see all that. That's relatively easy. If I go and change some groups and don't get on log, I'm pretty impatient. So what I did was I said, get me everything that's a group change and I added that to the SQL auditing. Then when I tested, I got the detection or the logs that I was expecting, but the problem with the way I work is now I don't know which uh, line was responsible for that log being available. It would be a problem if it was very high volume. So if we were generating thousands of events a second out of this auditing, I'd actually have to go and do it properly. Fortunately for this, uh, it's very low volume. So we can, we can add all of these in without too much impact to the database. The big hitters that we've had is around some of the internal systems working in our database, and they've all been related to database configuration, not this server side or the specification. And that's why there's not as many comments on the right hand side there, because I don't know which uh, piece of config worked, unfortunately. <laughs> GUI, don't do it. This is the easiest one to do in the GUI, you can just drop it down. You can just drop it down, and that's all you need to do because it's server wide. 
This is what it looks like beautifully when you run the SQL, you get commands completed successfully, and our logs are being, being put down into the application log now. Um, depending on the area you get, you should be able to work out which uh, line. Uh, there's an only one line difference in the two SQL scripts in the GitHub repository. There's a SQL script for pre-2017 and one for everything else from what we've tested. And there's a single store procedure that's not available in pre-2017. Pre okay, so now when we go back in, we've got the three pieces of auditing across our database highlighted there. Uh, and we can go in and, and check those. We, if we need to make minor modifications, we can do it in the GUI rather than rerunning all the SQL. Um, but for us, we maintain that uh, source of truth is our SQL uh, scripts to do this. The documentation, we, we did this to save ourselves a heap of drama. Um, what we did here was we tried to phase it out in the category mapping to uh, minor attack, and that just lets us flow through in a, a relative attack chain. Um, we put the tool in there, because uh, this is provided as well, so if you ever want to go and spin up the tools, the tests that they are uh, directly related and should be able to copy and paste. Um, then we added in which part of the monitoring is responsible for the detection and the tool that we're running. The reason we did this is if a piece of configuration did result in thousands of logs a second that weren't useful, we'd be able to say we can turn this piece of configuration off we're going to lose this ability to detect these items. Makes, it, makes the conversation a lot easier than, OK, just take it out and we'll, we'll hope it all works still. We can directly map all of these minus some of the privilege changes. But from what we've seen, the privilege change ones aren't too bad. So for an individual item, this one's related to the dirt tree command. You'll get the tool we use, which is SQL Shell or Squish or however you want to say it. The command, so we're uh, executing and we're asking it to then go and get this remote directory and return the results there. Uh, it's a master uh, database audit item, uh, and you'll have the event that goes into the application log there, which is the 33205. They're all 33205s. And then we just put a hopefully human readable sort of um, description around where this might occur in the attack chain. Because too often when I'm writing descriptions, I literally write the technical description of what's going on, and it doesn't really help our analysts or, or anyone understand why we're trying to detect it. So this one, basically, we're going to try and detect someone leaking the NTLM hash through this particular technique. And it's the account running the SQL service, which can be quite a privileged account within the domain. Other pieces of documentation, uh, these are all JSON files, these are all in the GitHub repository. This is a metadata document we produce all of our detections. Um, it has things like whether it would be eligible for an on-call, so high, um, high confidence and, and high priority. It'll have links to the tools and any of the references um, that we have. Has a larger description, has where it fits in the attack matrix to map it there. Has where it fits within CSC, we started doing that, and then they all map to the same thing, because monitoring and analysis of audit logs is mostly what we're doing here. Um, and then it will have your log sources, so we need Windows application logs, and then we need a specific event ID of 33205, which is in there, uh, there, 33205. And so with JSON then, it's really easy for us to put it into other formats and, and analyze and look at our detections and what logs we need to get X, Y, and Z outcomes. The testing document, these are quite easy. This, this one is SQL Recon, which is, we'll go through that in a sec. Um, but this one will go and download this DLL. Um, you, you can compile the DLL. You can use that one if you want. It won't go anywhere. Um, but it's basically an Empire beacon back into our research environment. Um, so if you do want to then modify that, because a lot of the time what I find testing the tools, and, and there's a, an example later on, is half the battle is getting the syntax right. So SQL Shell does it a certain way. Metasploit wants certain information. SQL Recon needs double quotes or single quotes, and, and it takes time. Um, and sometimes you will have a tool that simply will not work with the command you're trying to run. Um, this is an example of that a little bit later. All right, into the good stuff. The reason we actually do all this is to get detections. Um, we start with tools as well. So this one is SQL Shell. Uh, it's really easy. It's just a command line interface that you can um, connect to an MS SQL server. And we combine that then with an article like this from Hack Tricks, yep, Hack Tricks um, which has a heap of raw SQL that will achieve similar outcomes to the tooling that's available, like the SQL recons, Metasploit, those sorts of things. 
The reason we start with this is to gain a greater understanding of, of what's happening under the hood. So if I can go and execute commands using raw SQL, it gives me a much better understanding of what's going on versus just running a tool where I say, hey, run this command and I don't really know what's going on. Because at the end of the day, to understand and get to the logs, we need to know what the tool is doing. So we almost always start with trying to do it manually and get an understanding, and then if that becomes too hard, we just use the tools. Um, which does happen sometimes. Metasploit, pretty old now, but really useful, has a heap of built-in MS SQL modules. Um, and this is a really good example where we went and crafted a heap of detections. We spent hours on um, logging. We ran the Metasploit enum for MS SQL, and it generated zero detections. So I was like, oh, here we go. So into the, the good thing though is these are all open source. So into the source code, what is Metasploit doing when it's enumerating? And we get the raw SQL it's running. It's like, oh, it's querying that table, not that one. It's doing it this way. And so we can pull those out, run those manually, and get the um, order scripts or the logging scripts getting what we need. So Metasploit's still really good. Uh, CME is really good. It's got a heap of built-in uh, MS SQL stuff to enumerate and brute force users and get um, uh, command execution onto a box. SQL Recon, I think SQL Recon's written in C Sharp, C Sharp or, or something like that. Um, run that on the Windows side of things, so now we're able to test both on Linux land with, with SQL Shell and um, CME, and then running it on uh, Windows Box with SQL Recon and Power Up SQL. And Power Up SQL is built in PowerShell. So now we've got a really good spread of tools that have heap of functionality built in. We've got ways to do things manually. Uh, tools built in SQL, tools built in C Sharp, all that sort of stuff. And it can sometimes make a difference what language the tool is built in. Surprisingly, and this is a surprise to me over the last few months, in that the logs will look different. And that's painful uh, for us trying to craft detections based on logs that should look a certain way. And when we try a different tool and do the same thing, it looks completely different. So we put our detections into three categories and then a dumping ground of others. Um, and the big one that we started with was stored procedure use. Uh, this is where we can get a lot of um, the execution uh, type detections. We can use those to gain the system privilege to then execute into the OS to then go on from there. Secondly are SQL queries. There's lots of juicy information in databases and so we can monitor for actual queries. Uh, one of the really nice things about the logs is it does not return the results of the query. We hoped it didn't and, and it doesn't and that would be an issue. So if you uh, execute a query against something that would be considered sensitive data, it'll just tell you what query is run, not the results, which is good. And then authentication. Authentication ties it all together uh, and it's probably the last thing that we use in our detections apart from your brute forcing and your enumeration. Um, but in and, in and of itself, there's not, there's not a lot of context unless it's a user such as a receptionist logging in, um, but, but then that poses technical challenges sometimes to, to correlate that in one, one item. And we have privilege changes, config changes, other things we can do to a database that might have one or two detections but weren't worth their own category. Alright, here we go. So, live demo, I cop lots, lots of flat for this. Um, just do a video. Nah. <laughs> All right. So, what we will do? It's a default password. Don't, don't judge me. <laughs> do that password. So we'll we'll start with just a couple of uh, attacks into an MS SQL database. So we're going to. Log on. So this is our SQL shell. So we're now, we've, we've cheated a bit. We've got a user. We're not going to do the initial access stuff. But we're going to stay in the database so that we're not going to break out and uh, there's, there's my notes because I can't type. But we're not going to break out into the operating system yet because that would then bring in normal logs. So I will start by stealing the NTLM hash of the account running the SQL service. So we'll do that and then in this pre-prepared tab, we will fire up Responder. Let's get a couple of requests in so I'm not working. Great. Ah, here we go. So here's Responder. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen Responder, it just sits on the network and is, has been used to abuse uh, local authentication and that sort of stuff. This is really interesting when we started using it. For anyone with Defender ATP, it's, I don't know if this is documented, all those names aren't on my network. That's Defender putting them out locally on the wire. 
and if it gets a response, you'll get an alert back into security through ATP that responders on the network. Really cool functionality that we actually didn't know existed, so none of those um, are on the network. What we'll do though is go back to our tab, our tacker tab, nope, that's for later. Here we go. So it's as simple as execute directory and then go back and list me out this directory. So it's listed out the SMB share, and of course there's nothing there because there's not really an SMB share there. But what we should have is the NTLM hash for the service account. So it's kind of pretty simple, and the big danger, as I mentioned before, is that public is uh, granted the execution right on that uh, stored procedure to do that by default. So any database user can execute that stored procedure. You'll either get that one there. If it's got a dollar sign, it's the system account. And if it's a user account, they call them service accounts, so they're just users with SVC underscore, um, you'll get that as well. The advantage of getting a user account, a service account, is it may be used across other databases. You'd hope not, but could be. Um, but the machine account is still very useful um, if you're able to get the NTLM hash. Um, so if we just jump back into here, we've got no detections related to SQL. This one, I was gonna, I was gonna turn it off, but it's funny. Um, Carly, change the host name. <laughs> Carly. When Carly authenticates the Windows, it'll pass, pass the host name. The amount of red teams we've caught, because Carly is present as the host name, is not zero, and it kind of, kind of should be. <laughs> just, just change it. Um, and and that, 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 I suppose that's the advantage of being on the logging side. We see what the tools do, and it's, it's kind of funny to us. We do like to see it. Uh, Parrot's the same. If you authenticate to Windows, the operating system passes a heap of data that you may be unaware of. So we'll close that one out and we'll pretend we changed the host name. So that one's gone. We don't get anything. So we've got the NTLM hash for a uh, system. I authenticated because I'd already done, let's say I was really smart and had got that user account. Uh, and we've authenticated in a run of store procedure. We get nothing. So I'll do, um, how are we going for time? Not great. I'll do one more and we'll just steal a, a password hash for the SA account. So SA is built in, and what will happen here is very quickly... Oh. So we uh, paste this in and go. Now SQL Shell doesn't return it very nicely, but lucky for me, SA is at the bottom there. There's the SQL password hash for the SA account. Um, Nice and easy to get that one. Look, there's some privilege to run um, that particular query, and we've cheated and give ourselves uh, admin rights in the database, um, but we do that to progress the testing. Uh, I'm not smart enough to escalate um, all the time. <laughs> so once again, we'll, we'll have nothing. Um, but we jump into our database and execute our... Oh, completed successfully. Excellent. Um, the login's here. So if we go across to this data spec, uh, database audit spec, this took way, way too long for me to figure out, is we refresh it, and we get it. Yeah, cool. Oh, this one here, let's open that. Oh, oh it has come in, but the security policies hasn't. You actually gotta refresh each item to get the data to show, and that took me way too long to figure out. <laughs> yeah. That's in there now. We will very quickly uh, run our SQL uh, SA query, go, we've got an SA. I'll run one more that we didn't run before. Um, uh, let's go, uh, let's just turn on XP command shell, so a config type. Uh, cool. So CMD command shell doesn't work. The beauty of some of these is even where the statement doesn't work, it may still generate the log we need. Uh, so not all the tests will result in a system change, which is the way we want it sometimes. Now the logging has been turned on, and we have uh, an agent on that box, but it would be the same with Windows event forwarding, and we go and run the same test again, and, and we've got stuff to do with the database now. Um, it's that quick once we turn it on with the SQL monitoring, it just goes live. Um, and comes through. So that's, I'll wrap the live demo up there. Um, but you can see the 
speed in which we can get the logs in now. Now that we've got that SQL script uh, to do what we need, we can get the logs in. So I won't go through all the detections because we, these slides were in case my demo didn't work. But what, <laughs> so I, did, I did have a slight backup plan. The only one that I will go through is this one here. Oh, of course, it didn't. Here we go. Boom, 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 boom. Dirt tree. Come on, Shell. <laughs> uh, trust in something. This is the cool one. So this is another stored procedure only available in 2017 and above and it'll allow us to get another way to execute um, commands. Took me you know, way too long, I didn't solve it in the end. But we can see here, uh, there is a difference between these two slides. The big difference is in this um, demo that they give, you can call a single file name. We can pop, everyone pops cow. You can pop cow because you're not going to pass it any arguments. When I tried to put all the arguments into the file name, didn't work, split it out into info.arguments, works a treat. And this is what happened time and time again with the testing. The, the test and the template um, source code can be so wrong sometimes and it does take quite a while to understand the error, adjust it and get to where we need to be. Now what this one would have done in the background is, um, yep, tells you it's attacking. It'll go and download this DLL. It will then add the hash and this is what we can detect. We can't actually detect this running. Um, it adds a hash to the trusted assembly so the SQL will run it. Then it goes through all of this, calls it as a custom stored procedure, and we would get an Empire beacon uh, back to, uh, to our box. There's the, uh, the save slide in case the demo didn't work, but I think I'm on running out of time anyway. Um, and we would get our system agent back, or we'd get the beacon running as the SQL um, service account. Detections for all of these, they are in the slides. You will laugh at their simplicity. There's no need to overcook these. We group by some users there. We set the ID in Windows to narrow the amount of, of, of alerts, sorry, of events the alerts are going to look at. And this one is simply a regex saying if this statement contains trusted assembly.star, which is anything, HTTP, that is a detection for an uh, a uh, stored procedure grabbing a DLL from the internet is really as, as sometimes as simple as that. There were many struggles through this. Um, the exactness of logging, we've been through that in the configuration. You need to know everything you want to log ahead of time and that's not always possible. Even with testing tools, which is the second part, the testing breadth is massive. We have only five tools up there because they're open source, but there's more. Each of the frameworks has built-in modules for SQL that we haven't tested yet. You're then in a position where testing, nothing happens, go back to the configuration, retest, retest, retest. Log structure, which is, that's breadth of testing. Log structure, this is probably the worst regex ever. 22,000 steps. 22,000, I'm trash at regex, but, but it got the bits I wanted. Um, so then my colleague fixed it, um, and we're, we're, we're still in the couple of thousand steps for these, because what SQL does is it's, it's XML, technically that's correct, but it just dumps all of this data into the data tags unstructured. It is in relatively the same order each time, uh, but all we want is the statement, the user, and a few other bits and pieces, and for regex to do this, yeah, it, it's expensive in regex. It has been slightly fixed, yeah, and, and all that is in one XML tag, so it's, it's difficult to get, get to the bits that we want. And then deployment. Deployment is, is difficult. Uh, it's not the end of the world. I'm sure the DBAs can go and, and automate all of this, but it does need to be done on every single database. There's no easy way just to group policy this up. I, I don't know of any way, so there is, a, there is a manual change. If we then need to add stuff in six months because we've found no, new stored procedures, we may be just, it may be easy just to rip the config out, put the whole new config back in. So next up for us on all of this is custom application monitoring is going to be difficult, but with the queries and the executions, we're going to be able to begin to look at that. And surprise to me, there's an application into OT that we had never even thought of uh, until we read this Mandiant report, which was related to cosmic energy. Um, it stood out to us. There's Windows boxes in all of these. 
and MS SQL is abused to get a command to run against a, a, a unit, a control unit. The advice is to look for the enablement of, of extended stored procedures, but unfortunately, and I understand why, it does not go into what we need to look for. So simply turning the stored procedure on is relatively easy to detect. What you then do with the stored procedure is really, really important, and we haven't been able to dig into what that might be. The artifacts, as I've, as I've said, there is a um, GitHub repository which will contain um, the source code for the DLL if you want to run SQL Recon to get a shell um, of your choosing. It'll have JSON for the metadata testing detections and then the overall spreadsheet just with the summary of all the detections and the uh, configuration related to those. <laughs> I was only allowed to do one transition like that, so I had to do the last one. Um, any questions on any of that? Oh, uh, yeah. So, obviously, very complicated to sort of go through that whole process in terms of like, we've got the problem, we're trying to solve the problem, how do we go for it? Can you, is there some kind of defined methodology or process that you're using in terms of like going through this, I have this problem set, so how do I get to this end? Loosely, very loosely, and the problem, and the reason for it is it's always different. So we take something like certificate abuse, which is 18 months old now, and it, it once again comes down to our, our basic process is let's abuse it, and then we need to be able to detect that abuse. That's the process. It's unfortunate that every time the abuse is different, and so is the, the end goal. So there's no no formal process. We we know what we want to achieve and it's working our way back from, oh, no detections, all the way back to the tool, and then back forward again. Yeah. I'd love it if there was a process that could probably all went half of this. Well, yeah, it sort of, it implies that it's a very specialised and high-level skill, because you need to look, have those people who know what they're looking for as well. Yeah, I'd say it's a niche -ish yeah. skill. Um, but yeah, it's, it has to be done because the problem with these tools, the, the authors of the tools, they're, they're brilliant. They're way smarter than me. I'm just going to use them and then work my way back. Takers don't care if you don't have time to get your logging right and your detections right. So it's probably a, a skill set that it evolves over time as well in a SOC. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is interest as well. Getting it from Hack the Box, that's where there was already some research, but then the rabbit hole was, let's, uh, let's mimic this Hack the Box box. Yeah. Any other? Oh, uh, yeah. This might be a really silly question, but if someone wants to implement those you know, tomorrow or whatever in their environment, is it much more risk to performance or operations or even setup and apply, or is it too much just you know, there's no risk for real? No, just do it. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, we've deployed, we've deployed out. So our, our advice to the audience we work with, obviously, pick your test box, do that. Through all of the testing, no. Nah, no impact to the database. It's not a high volume logging set. But if, if I was to give you a massive Sysmon config and go put that on your domain controllers, yeah, we might generate hundreds a second. This doesn't generate. This, gener this tops out a, a log a second for a box. Yeah. Are you? You mentioned there's no sense in the data because you're not logging the query output. But if there's often still sense of data in the query itself, yep. you deal with that or don't you see that data in the log? Yeah, so what that's then a risk reward conversation. Is the risk of that data going into a, an application or you can point it at security so that only local admins can read it? Is the risk of that data in uh, table names and in the query? Um, high enough for it not to be used in detections, and it changes from org to org. Some orgs will be, yeah, yeah, that's fine. The actual table structure, we can we can have some of that sensitive data in our logs. The benefit of the detections outweighs the risk of that data being in a same platform and on on the local box. Yeah, difficult though because we don't know necessarily ahead of time what query might generate sensitive data. Yeah, yeah. You're saying that the Obviously, this is not very well logged at the moment, uh, and, and not many people are aware of this. In your investigations, because this isn't really being looked at at all, are you seeing much pressure on the fact to duplicate the actual to make detection via the logging implement, or just they don't care because no one's looking at it? I, I think. There has been enough detect. If you had good detections on the OS, you could get by. 
because at some point, if I executed that DLL, I'll, I'll get OS level detections. And so people were kind of, well, we got them. We're not sure exactly how they did it, but we got them and it's good enough. Um, and honestly, there's easier ways. If a ransomware game gets into an environment, probably not going to hit SQL. They're going to abuse certs, they're going to abuse Kerberos, and those sorts of things are still so easy to abuse that this is a bit more niche. But the problem for us is, it, it doesn't matter, because what are they going to do tomorrow? And that's why we have to put this in, whether we're going to get detections today or not. Um, but I think in the past, enough's been good enough and getting OS level detections, or once they break out, your EDR gets them. Not understanding how they abuse SQL hasn't been high on the priorities for orgs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yep. Do we share the slides after this as well? You, that's up to you. Oh, yeah, you can do uh, Oh, it's right at the start. Yeah, I'll go back. <laughs> Please hold Please hold. <laughs> oh. yep. That bottom one there. So yeah, there'll be an MS SQL monitoring um, repo in that. No more? Yep. Have you looked at the state of other SQL servers? No. Nah. Just Microsoft. Just this one to start with. Just because it, it's used everywhere. Um, SCCM has it. Um, yeah, it, it's very out there. Some of the next stages are other ones. Yeah. Yep. But none of this applies to Postgres or any other database type at all. Oracle. Yeah, none of it. Very specific. Another question? Yeah. Did you look at the snare or the snare? Snare. Snare. Yeah. Oh, to log into SQL? No. No. Does it have SQL modules? Yeah, and that, that's in, in the other slide where we looked at products. We avoided looking for another product to deploy, which is why we didn't look at Snare. We wanted, yeah, we just wanted to say, how do we get this natively, or as natively as we can in, in the database? Yeah, yeah. Because you've also got the Azure products for SQL up in Azure. We didn't look at those for this. This, is, this was how to create logs, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, Tristan. Thank you.